All right, we're ready. Hi, right, guys. Good morning. Um, as as agents, a lot of loan types or a few of the loan types we're going to go over may not only help you with your buyers, but could also help you if you have a listing and you get an offer, and so you know maybe what may be involved as far as the listing goes or the offer goes. So these are listed here to pretty much the type of loans we do. Um, I put them in the order of what we do the most of out of our office, but it doesn't mean one's more important than the other or you want to stick to a conventional versus say VA, but just pretty much what we do here. Um, so we'll start off with the conventional loan. So in a conventional loan, there's many types of loan within the conventional loan. So this is just your, your basic Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac product, which is, is more or less. So we can go with as low as a 3% minimum down payment. And to keep in mind, the maximum loan amount is $510,400 for your maximum. So what does that mean? The loan size cannot go over that amount to keep it as a conventional loan, but your purchase price can. So we need to be careful. Some loans have loan limits and others have sale price limits. But for a conventional loan, it's five, ten, four hundred. If you're not a first time, and the three percent down is more or less for a first time buyer. If you're not a first time buyer going to conventional loan, you have to go with a five percent down payment. And then there's also some variations to that, some other type of loans. And we could get into that either another time or maybe towards the end, some other type of conventional loans. Now everybody I believe knows the seller credit. So more or less, a lot of people ask, can we roll closing costs into the mortgage? We cannot. However, we can get closing costs paid by the seller up to certain percentages on a conventional loan. So if you're doing the minimum down payments or anywhere from 3% down payment to a 10% down seller credit maximum. If we go from a 10% to a 25% down payment, it jumps to a 6% seller credit. And then there's also, if it's over 25%, we can get a 9% seller credit, but in 18 years of doing this, I've never seen a 9% seller credit. Um, but more or less, that is the where the seller is agreeing to pay a certain percentage, if not all of the closing costs, depending on the purchase price. Now, I'm sure all you people, all you guys have learned about or heard about private mortgage insurance or PMI. And that is an insurance put on by private insurance entities if the down payment is less than 20%. The closer you get to 20%, the lower your monthly payment would be. And the main thing to remember about all conventional loans, whether it's the private mortgage insurance, interest rate, things like that, it's credit score driven. So the better your credit score, the better your interest rate, the better your, your factors for private mortgage insurance, things like that. Um, if we're going in, now it's not on the slide here, but if we're going into multifamilies, and we'll just talk owner-occupied multifamilies right now. You have to have a minimum 50% down payment for a two unit and a 20% down payment for a three or four unit property. So even though you're gonna live there, invest or the multifamilies have different down payments versus just a single family or a condo. And condos and single families follow the same guidelines as far as down payments go. Uh, Marie, are we going to do questions per slider at the end? I was just going to say, do, I was going to ask you the same question. Um, does anyone have any questions? I do. I'm sorry. I'm just not quite following the, what a seller credit means, 3% and 6%. Okay, so that, I'm, that great question. The 3% or 6%, that's off the sale price. So if you have a sale price of 300,000, um, the maximum seller credit of 3% would be $9,000. Now keep in mind, 
if closing costs are only $7,000 and you made the contract read $9,000, that money's gonna go back to the seller. So we wanna get those, the seller credit as close as possible to what there is so money doesn't go back to the seller if they agreed to give 9,000. And on any purchase transaction, um, the buyer can't take money back. So let's say if the seller credit was 9,000 and yet it's only 7,000 in closing costs, the buyer will not walk away with a $2,000 check. It's just gonna go back to the seller. So we wanna narrow those closing costs in you know, as close as possible so you can just make the negotiation or the offer the best. Okay. And the same thing with 6%. If it's, um, you know, if it's a $300,000 mortgage, that's an $18,000 seller credit. Closing costs, or I'm sorry, it's $300,000 sale price. Closing costs very seldom or unless taxes are huge, will never get that high. So typically, even though it offers 6%, we usually stay around the three to 4% range. Tom, okay. yes. you, you would normally see a seller credit when the buyer either doesn't have enough money to pay the down payments and the closing cost. Maybe they have enough in their bank account for their down payment, but they're short funds for their closing costs. Or maybe the buyer wants to do some work in the house after they move in and they want to save their savings to do those improvements and they might want to ask the seller to help contribute with their closing costs so then what the the, the buyer is uh beholden to the seller the, the buyer owes the seller uh, no the seller is actually it in, if we use numbers if they are going to sell a house for 300,000, if that's the purchase price, and the buyer is gonna get $10,000 in closing costs, then essentially on paper, it says they're selling the house for 300,000, but at the closing table, they're gonna take 10,000 of that 300 and give it to the buyer to pay their closing costs. Actually, they're gonna pay the closing costs for the buyer. So sometimes using a seller credit in a contract can be a very tough pill for a seller to uh, swallow because essentially they're, they're agreeing to sell their house for more money than they're actually gonna get because they're gonna give part of their, that money to the buyer to pay their closing costs. But this can make or break a deal, right Maria? Well, if a buyer doesn't have the money, yeah. yes. There's just negotiating tools, right? That's all they are, really? Well, it's a way of helping a buyer get a house when they don't have sufficient funds to pay both their down payment and their closing costs. And it's a very common for first-time home buyers. I'd okay. say, Paul, would you agree, Paul, you see it more with first-time home buyers than with uh, move-up buyers? Yes. And then, I mean, in another way we can look at it too, not all depends what their down payment is going to be, but if, if the person has good credit, PMI is not that, ex, not that expensive. So if they were going to put 20% down, even as a first time buyer, or even if they're not a first time buyer, maybe we go to 15% down and they can use that 5% extra towards closing costs. For instance, if they can't get a seller credit or if they don't have enough funds, but yeah, Maria's right. It's usually the first time buyer um, that's maybe doesn't have the money for down payment. I'm sorry, for closing costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I get it, thank you. And Maria, I believe we have one more line on debt to income ratio. Here it is. Um, so that the income ratio, that's, that's a big key of whether we can do the mortgage or not do the mortgage. So what that is, is we're going to add up all the, the buyer's debt, which would be car loans, student loans, credit cards, divided by their income. And on a conventional loan, we can go up to 50%, but typically that's going to be off their credit score and off their down payment. So somebody's putting the minimum 3% down we cannot go up to a 50% debt to income ratio. It's usually when somebody puts 20% down or more, we can go that high. So there's a lot of mixing and matching that goes along with it. And it's almost, it's almost like a puzzle, but 
if somebody's putting 20% down, um, the debt to income ratio can go that high, but again, doesn't mean they want it to either. And now I think we could go on to the next one. Okay. So an FHA loan, this is probably the second most loans, loan type we do here at, out of our office. Um, great loan in some cases, not a great loan in other cases. So with, with FHA, it's not a first time buyer program, but most likely or most of the time you can only have one FHA loan at a time. So if a person had one F, currently has enough FHA loan and they need another FHA loan, they have to get rid of their, their current FHA loan. There are some things that could get past it, but more or less just one FHA loan at a time. We have a 3.5% down payment, um, but we, there are loan limits with the FHA loan, and it goes by county. So I put the four counties that surround us the most. And you can see, so again, it, it's a loan limit. So somebody could needs to go with an FHA loan and they're looking at a $400,000 home. As long as we can get the loan size or the loan amount on, at the 353, then we can go with an FHA loan. A, a feature is a 6% seller credit. Now again, on the higher end houses, they're probably not gonna need 6%, but on a home that sells for maybe 100 to 150,000, they're gonna need all of the 6% of the seller credit. The major drawback with FHA loan these days, or really the only negative is a mortgage insurance for life. Um, it does not disappear. It does in some cases, but generally on an FHA loan, it's for the life of the loan unless they refinance or they sell. Um, if we're doing a conventional loan with 3% down, that, that mortgage insurance is on for nine to 10 years anyway. So typically a first time buyer, they're really not worried about the, the mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. Cause they, they're figuring maybe they're gonna move up anyways before nine or 10 years are up anyway. Now, the debt to income ratio at 47%, that's re really for the lower credit. If somebody has better credit, but let's say they have to go FHA because a minimum down payment, we can go up to a 50% debt to income ratio or even higher. Again, not that we want to, but every, every buyer is a case by case thing. No, no two buyers are the same with their income, their assets, their credit. Um, are they a first time buyer? Are they moving up? Are they downsizing? So again, like I said, the previous slide, it's a puzzle. Um, FHA is a great loan. And, and like I said, in most cases, the mortgage insurance for life of the loan doesn't scare too many people off. Any questions on FHA? Hey, Paul, is there a difference for FHA loans? if you're buying a condo versus buying a single family home? Yes. Um, so if we're, if we're doing a condo purchase and the buyer has to go FHA, we need an FHA approved condo complex. Um, there, is, there, is a, there is a website I could send out after, but more just either text me, is this condo FHA approved? For a while there, there was, there was FHA was bringing back spot approvals. So more or less, you're approving the individual condo unit. But with COVID, we do not have any investors doing that right now. So with COVID coming around, a lot of guidelines have changed. Um, so we do need the FHA approval on the condo complex. So that's, that's an important thing to look at if the buyers want a condo and they want to go FHA we need the FHA approved condo. Paul, if I could just stop for one second. When I have an FHA buyer, before I show them the condo, I go out to the FHA condo list and yep. I check to see whether the complex is FHA approved. I use this site so much, I have it bookmarked. And so, this is online, right? Like FHA.gov, okay. 
I will send out, or Paul will send out a link after the session. Um, it's very easy uh, to use. You just go to the link and you'll enter the state that is a required field. And you can do it by town or zip code. I would not use the name of the complex because you don't know how FHA has entered it. And sometimes if it's abbreviated MT for mountain or um, Ridge RG, you know, it, it, I always use the town and then I scroll through the list for the town to see if I can see the name of that particular complex listed. Yeah, and that's a great point Marie just made because this way you'll see every condo complex in the town. So if, if you want to stick with a specific town and one's not approved, maybe you'll see another complex that is approved or surrounding towns. So it's good to pop up, you know, all the condos in the town. Um, uh, Paul, yeah. uh, when you're getting an FHA mortgage, does the property have to meet some minimum condition requirements? Yeah, so when, when the appraisal is going to get done on an FHA mortgage, and it's really not just FHA anymore, but all properties, but they're a little picky with FHA, um, and a lot of it's safety issues. Um, does, does it not have railings down, basement stairs, or front steps? Um, what else was there? Any cracked glass? So any anything like this would be a red flag for an appraiser. And if it's called out, it will need to be repaired before closing. Unless possibly we have a weather related issue like say painting. But even on, on a conventional mortgage, a lot of times that will get called out as well. Um, especially if the peeling paint is pretty drastic because now you're talking about the integrity of the house, uh, possible mold forming. Um, so it's good to have all the house, you know, any type of mortgage, FHA or conventional, in decent shape, but more so appraisers seem to pick a loan or they're looking a little bit closer. So it, it is the main things again, safety issues, the peeling paint, railings glass broken, um, you know, anything that can cause a hazard to, to the buyer or their family. Does anybody have any questions about FHA mortgages? So really the difference between conventional and FHA um, as far as preference for the buyer would be the amount of money to put down um, just the upside is PMI on one side and PMI, not PMI on the other side, depending upon debt to income ratio. Yes and no. So the PMI will be there, depending on the down payment, the PMI will be there on both loans, conventional FHA, except FHA, it's on for the life of the loan. Okay. Um, but so what I was saying before, say if somebody's doing a conventional loan with 3% down, that mortgage insurance is going to be on for about 10 years anyway. So that's why a lot of people, especially the first time buyers, they're not really worried about the FHA mortgage insurance on the life of the loan. Um, because it'll, um, cause they don't know when in 10 years where they're going to be anyway, they figure it's a starter home, but that's really, um, otherwise they're very comparable loans, especially nowadays. Amy. Another difference with FHA and conventional PMI is for a conventional loan, the PMI is really based on the buyer's credit scores. Whereas for FHA, it's a government loan and the government likes to keep things simple. And so regardless of your credit score, the um, PMI formula is based on a fixed rate. So someone with good credit and someone with not so good credit has to pay the same percentage in PMI, correct, Paul? Yes. Um, and usually that credit score where we start to is right around the 700 mark, where where the mortgage insurance may be a little bit a little bit higher one way or a little bit higher the other way. So yeah, so if you're doing FHA loan, whether you have 800 credit 
there's 60 credit, your mortgage insurance will be the same, the same amount for an FHA loan. What do you mean when you say it's a government loan? Um, exactly that. It's, it's, it's the, what makes it a government loan is really the mortgage insurance because it's the, the ones holding the mortgage is going to be a Wells Fargo or a Chase or banks like that. The government part is the mortgage insurance is backed by the government. So versus a conventional loan, that's a private mortgage insurance company itself. So it's just the mortgage insurance is just, is more or less government backed. What entity of the federal government are you talking about? Uh, Department of uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it's, um, it's, let's just say it's a housing entity of the government that oversees housing. And Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, are they not also government entities? Y yes and no. The, they were in the beginning, the government more or less oversees it, but it's still not a government entity, even though the government has stepped in and, and uh, more or less runs it, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I have one question. So if I have like Joe, first time home buyer, what, why, which one would they choose? You know, if I said, hey, there's different types of loans, what would make one more attractive over the other? I mean, obviously the property is dependent upon one over the other, if, but. And, and, that, and that's the puzzle, you know, what, what's, what's their down, and that's why we do the pre-approval ahead of time in most cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the FICO so score. We can see their income. We can see their assets. Yeah. You know, so what is the what is the buyer's qualification? They only go FHA. Um, you know, if they if they're putting ten percent down, five to ten percent down, and good credit score, we should avoid FHA. Um, okay. So the pivot if they point. We have three and a half percent down, and the credit score is is pretty bad and the mortgage insurance is going to be higher on a conventional loan, then maybe we go FHA. Okay. So, it's, so there, really, it's just going to be buyer specific. Okay. So the pivot point is the pre-qualification process. Yeah. You, take it, you take it from there. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. And we good for the next slide? The chat? <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of, and this, this is actually a great one, uh, Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, or CHAFA. Um, it's for first-time buyers, but if you have not owned the property in the last three years, you're considered a first-time buyer again. Um, nice about this loan and what Maria was talking about, a first-time buyer, a lot of times they don't have money saved up. So they can get 100% financing. So if the house cost 200,000, they could get a mortgage for 200,000, but it would be in two loan amounts. It'd be the, the DAP is down payment assistance. So that is a separate mortgage, but it's exactly that. It's giving you the down payment to purchase a home, which makes it, um, which makes it very, again, very attractive for first time buyers that maybe has not saved a lot. And if we can get 100% financing with a seller credit, then you know we can, the buyers can pretty much go with very little to no money out of pocket to buy their first home. Now this is the next line where there's a loan limit and a sale price limit. Remember we we're talking. I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense. It should be an, it should be income limit and a sale price limit. But on the sale price limit, if you remember back at FHA or conventional, that was a loan limit. Chapter has a sale price limit, which means you cannot go over a specific amount on the sale price. Um, I have a chart that I can send out to you guys as well. But say in Hartford County, it's about $313,000 for the sale price. And that is a little bit, that's a little bit lower than it was last year. So every, every year, or not every year, but every once in a while, Chaffa does make changes to the income limit or the sale price limit. 
So this chart, the chart I could send out to you guys is going to show the sale price limit as well as the income limit. Uh, the seller credit allowed is going to follow a conventional or an FHA guideline. So what I mean by that is Chaffa has two loan types. They'll have a conventional loan and they have an FHA loan. If they're doing 100% financing, it is going to be a conventional Chaffa loan. It's going to be a 3% down payment assistance. Or if it's an FHA loan, it's going to be 3.5% down payment assistance. But in either case, it's still 100% financing. Now, the debt to income ratio, they're very strict with. If you recall in the other slides, it was 47% FHA, could be up to 50% conventional. 35% and 43% are the CHAFA guidelines. The 35% is just their housing debt. So we're going to look at the principal and interest, the taxes and the, the insurance, and the private more, or the PMI payment divided by their income, and it can't be over 35%. And then the 43% is all the debt. So it's going to take all the housing debt plus the personal debt, whether, again, student loan, car loan, and it cannot be over 43%. And Chaffa does not have any wiggle room at all. So it cannot be 43.001%. So between the income limit, the sale price limit, the ratios, the conventional CHAFA, the FHA CHAFA, is very important to put all the numbers together and make sure the numbers work. The buyers do need to take a home buyer education course um, that is available online. Most people take it online these days. Um, there is a cost to it, but what we do is we supply them a, a coupon code number so when they register for the class, there is no, there is no cost to them. Uh, again, it's, it's a great loan, um, especially somebody with not much in savings and they need a down payment assistance um, or things like that. Now, um, like all the other loans, there's a lot of nuances to the loan. Um, it's important to look at the income of the buyer because if somebody has overtime income, but they haven't been at the place or receiving overtime for two years, CHAP is going to use the overtime to see if they're over the income limit, but they won't let them use the overtime to qualify for the mortgage. So there's, there's a double dip in, in some cases. So again, a great loan. Some things they make it a little bit tougher, but you know, things that we look at ahead of time if they're first time buyers. With, and also with Chaffa though, there are targeted areas and pretty much what a targeted area is just a place that maybe Chaffa doesn't follow their normal guidelines as far as the income limit goes, um, or if you're a first time buyer. And they're usually it's this inner cities Harford, Manchester, New Britain, Bridgeport. So towns like that have targeted areas, but it's not the whole town, it's spe specific areas within the town that does have the, the targeted areas. And also with the target area, you also get a disc, most of the time get a discount on the interest rate. So if interest rates at right now 2.875, it's a quarter percent off the rate. So they can get a, they, if they're in the targeted area, they can get a rate of 2.625, which is again, just unheard of rates these days. Any questions with the chaffer? Maria, any questions you could think of? No, you covered everything, I think, you know, at a high level, but maybe somebody that's attending has some questions. Yeah. Uh, I do, Paul, can you talk a little bit about debt to income ratios are are debt to income ratios based on the buyer's debt now or the buyer's debt that they're going to have based on the house deal you know yes and yes right. so it, it's based on current debt on the overall ratio but it does it, it is adding in that the new house debt as well 
So, you know, if they're at, if they're at 43% now, say debt, they, debt, or let's say they're at, um, let me think, let me think. Uh, let's say they're at a 30% debt to income ratio before we even had in the housing expense. Depending on the housing expense, it, it's going to push them over the income limit or over the debt to income ratio limits. Okay. So, yes, it, it does include the future house payment. All right. Paul? Yeah. Yep. Can you explain what goes into the housing component of the ratio? What does that yep. do? Yeah, so the housing ratio on the 35% portion, that's just the house. That's going to be the principal and interest. The property taxes. Mommy, tell you. The homeowner's insurance. Uh, it could be condo fees if it's a condo and mortgage insurance. So those four or five things added together, divided by the, the buyer's income is gonna give them that 35% or less debt to income ratio. <clears throat> and then for the overall, it's gonna have all the housing stuff, plus the other which shows up on a credit report. Um, the student loans, the car loans, um, credit cards, you know, revolving debt, things like that. Got to help you out, Tom? Yes, absolutely. The okay. only other thing was, um, you know, when you take the, the real estate course over and over and over, they're, they're talking about um, bad things like redlining. Um, you're talking about targeted areas, but in your case, you're talking targeting in a good way, right? You're yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, redlining is a no-no in every business these days, but... What they're what it's really trying to do is maybe revitalize a portion of the city that can it maybe doesn't have a lot of real estate movement. So it can make the target area a little bit more attractive for specific buyer. And that again is by um, easing the debt to income ratio, or or, or what? <laughs> I kind of missed what the benefits that were being offered to, to the oh, for the target area. Yeah. Um, not not being a first time buyer and doing away with the income limit. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, so yeah, in the target area, you don't have to look at the income limit. It's still gonna go off the sale price limit, but it does do away with the income limit. Okay, thank you. The sale price limit might be higher. Yep. In a targeted area. Yeah. So yeah, and I'll I, I'll email out the the chaffer sheets. And a interest rate that's point uh, two five lower than the interest rate otherwise would be. Yep. Yeah. So like I said, so the two point eight seven five chaffer rate today would be two point six two five in a targeted area. <laughs> But it's the 100% down payment is the real, that's the gem. Yes. Yeah, yeah. the 100% down payment um, yeah. is, is the beauty of it. So, so, Paul, I have a potential situation where there's going to be three individuals going in on the purchase. Uh, how would you go about determining which way they go? Is it the person that's the highest income? I mean, how, how would you go about that? So that, that's, a, that's a tricky one. So if all three people are going to be on the mortgage, then it's going to add all three incomes together. So it could pop, it could pop them over the income limit. Now, what we've done in the past is you, we can only use, let's say it's, it's life, and together they're over the income limit. If they can qualify with just one of them, then we just put one on the mortgage <clears throat> and we can get around the income limit that way. But then do they qualify by themselves? So again, it's a lot of it's just a puzzle trying to find different ways uh, to put them in the best loan. But if, um, if all three people are going to be on the mortgage, they're going to look at all three incomes for the income limit. Okay. And what do you do for the FICO score? Is it just an average? <laughs> It's going to take the middle score of the lowest person. 
Okay. So if if two to if two to three have eight hundred credit as mid scores and the third person has a six fifty mid score, it's going to use use a six fifty mid score. Okay. So yeah, we'll go. It will go from the lower of the of the people, not the higher or the average. Paul. Mm hmm. For a chap a mortgage, does everybody on the mortgage have to live in the house that is being purchased? For a chap a mortgage, is every yes, yeah. So again, it's it's a first time buyer program. Um, actually, or no, depending on what we're looking. At. So in some cases too, we have one spouse that owns a house currently without the other spouse on it. So if both people, yes, do need to live in a house, but they may not qualify as first time buyers if, if one has owned a home within the past three years or currently owns a home. But for an FHA mortgage, does everybody who goes on that mortgage, if it's straight FHA, have to live in the house? No. Um, and also it could be, and a conventional mortgage. So what Maria is talking about is um is a non-occupant co-borrower. Um, usually it's a parent helping out a, a child to buy. So they're gonna they're gonna be on the mortgage even though. But the, the thing is though, as well as we're gonna look at the co-borrower, the non-occupant co-borrower's debt and income because they're as responsible for the mortgage if say the son or the daughter or it doesn't pay um but no not everybody needs to live in the house oh. am i there you are i'm just i because of the background noise i i mute myself after i ask my question oh no so, uh, something popped up on my screen that i lost connection but no you're still there okay the Paul, the reason I asked is that Amy mentioned that she was going to have three people on the mortgage. And, what, and one of my first questions would be, are all, pe all three people going to live in the home? Because that would affect which type of mortgage that they could potentially go for. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. So are all three people first-time buyers? Are all three people going to live there? Um, are the friends looking for an investment you know so just so keep in mind that fha and chaffa are owner occupants it's not an investment loan so i guess it all depends what the three buyers are gonna are gonna be doing um are they related are there income limits so they may not be able to go chaffa or are they just three people that are going to live together and then are they below the income limit or are they going to go in the target area so there there's a lot to it yeah um, but it, yeah, it's, that's, um, that's something that, you know, we'd find out after pre-approval process or during the process. Okay. Um, any other questions on Chaffa? Well, I know that, uh, there's, there's guidelines and a lot of specifics as far as like railings and steps and all that other stuff so that applies to heavily i think for chapa from my experience in the past yeah no no and like i said and any loan especially if it's a safety issue um you know because what banks look at you know if there's no railings down the steps to the basement whether a chaffa fha or conventional the homeowner falls you know banks don't care about if he broke a leg can he pay the mortgage yeah we just you know so then that's going to happen almost on every property. Okay. Now the last slide is VA. Do we want to hold VA for another time or are we still good? I'm good. If you want to care, cover it today. Yeah, we could cover it today. And then there's other loans that I'm not going to cover, but we can do another session. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite loans, VA loan. Um, we don't seem to do a lot up in this area. I do maybe one or two a year, um, but it's just, it's just a great product. Um, it's 100%, the biggest thing, 100% financing, and there's no mortgage insurance on it. 
So like the other loans that anything that's less than 20% down payment has mortgage insurance, uh, the VA loan does not. Now there is a VA funding fee, but that can, which is most, most of the time 2% of the, of the purchase price, but that will get through, added to the loan amount. But otherwise no PMI. Um, basically it goes by the, the conventional guideline of 510,400. Um, there are jumbo loan VAs, but we'll just stick to the regular VA right now. Um, they're in between the seller credit, so it could be up to a 4% seller credit. Um, the 47% debt to income ratio, which again, that's an average. In some cases, it could go a little bit higher, but we can just use a 47% for now. And the two biggest piece of paper for a VA loan for the veteran is their certificate of eligibility and their DD-214 paper. And, and that's the first thing I ask if somebody wants to buy VA, going with a VA mortgage, do they have the certificate of eligibility and do they have their DD-214? Um, and then as far as I know, we talked about inspections or, or appraisals. A pest inspection is required for a VA loan and it's paid by the seller. But again, just, just a great mortgage. Um, I wish we had more in this area, but we, we just do not. But again, a, a great loan. Paul? Yeah? A couple of questions. If somebody wants to use, um, get a VA loan, should they have their certificate of eligibility and DD-214 before they start the home buying process? Yes, it's, it's good to have. Um, certificate of eligibility seems to be a little bit easier to get because you just, I believe you can just get it going to the VA website. The DD-214 is something, I don't know if it's as easy to get. People seem to lose it more, especially if, these, if they've been out of the service for a while. Um, I believe that's the one that says they were, they were honorably discharged the DD-214. It's their discharge but, form. Yeah, so that is, those are forms that they should have, or if they tell you, yeah, they want to use a VA loan, you know, something that they should, if they don't have it, they should get. It just, it just makes the process a little bit easier. Well, you know how we talked a little bit about the property condition for VA, uh, for FHA? Yeah. Does VA have similar property condition rules? Yes. Um, you know, again, everything should be our safety issues, whether it's, whether it's mold, railings, cracked glass. Um, the pest, ins this pest inspection, say if, if they're in a city water and sewer, the pest inspection is required. Um, you know, a lot of times, or most, most mortgages, it's not required unless an appraiser points something out, but the pest inspection is required. Um, but they're going to follow pretty much the same guidelines as a VA. I mean, I'm sorry, as a FHA. What, what makes the VA more, the VA appraisal a little bit tougher is they're just, or it may take a little bit longer is there just not as many VA approved appraisers out there. So it does take a little bit longer between ordering it, uh, getting the appraiser out there and getting the report back. And Paul, is there a difference for VA for buying a condo versus a single family home? Yeah, so the, the it's gonna be, or the VA loan is gonna be like FHA. The complex does need to be VA approved. Um, what did mommy get you? Just, just like the FHA, just like the FHA. So, if it's um, if it's not VA approved, we cannot do the VA mortgages there. But if I understand correctly, the process to get a VA approval for a condo is not as tough as it is to get an FHA condo approval. But yes, we do need those requirements there. Hey, Paul, um, uh, FHA, VA, <clears throat> whenever you're talking about a government-run 
bureaucracy or organization, I think of, you know, Department of Motor Vehicles or any of these loans notorious for being super slow to go through the process until closing for some reason or other? Are there certain loans that are uh, involve the government HUD, for example, that you just dread dealing yeah, with? That, that's, a gr that's a great question. Uh, typically, the, not so much FHA, but VA loans do take a little bit longer. Um, a lot of, like a lot of it, I just said, it could be the appraiser, but say if you're, you're writing up a contract, you know, typically the nice thing is a 30 day commitment and 45 day closing. But on a VA loan, maybe we should put it, you know, push it out to 60 day for the closing day. Not that it can't get done sooner, but it, it is a little bit, a little bit more to the process. So that, and even Chaffa too. In our, type loan, the type of loan it is may make a difference of what type of dates you put on the contract. But as far as, um, again, as govern, government bureaucracy, really not. Um, great loans, um, like I said, especially the VA loan. Okay. And in, in a case, Maria, maybe this is more for you. In a case of um, a multiple offer situation where a house is really hot and there's, you know, seven offers. The seller's agent is presenting each and every offer to the sellers. Um, are they disclosing whether or not they're conventional FHA, CHAPA and so on or not? Um, it is a material fact that the listing agent should, um, should um, share with the seller when they present the offer. However, they are not supposed to um, put one loan in favor of another loan type. So they can't say that, or they shouldn't say to the seller, um, this one is higher, but it's VA. You know, they can't, you know, disparage one type of loan versus another. They're not supposed to. They're supposed to um, evaluate all offers based on the terms and conditions. And part of that is purchase price. Part of it is down payment. Part of it is um, the type of mortgage. And part of it is um, how quickly they can get that mortgage and how quickly they can close. And for some sellers, it may not be how quickly they can close, but whether or not the closing timeline is more favorable to the seller. So you could have two offers that are identical, but maybe the seller needs 60 days to get to get out and they're fine with a mortgage that's going to take 60 days to close. So it really depends on the seller's needs and wants. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on the VA? Now, Paul, I do believe, but I don't remember when it, exactly that VA decided for condos um, and PUDs to um, go by the FHA rules um, because VA decided that you know they didn't need to do keep doing it um, an approval list themselves. Um, but that is a difference between VA and FHA in that there was a time when a PUD had to get VA approved. And so if it was not VA approved in the past, even though VA may now follow FHA rules, um, I believe that once a condo or a PUD has not been approved, that unless there's a whole new review process done, that particular complex would not be eligible for a VA loan. Would that be true? Yeah, I, I believe, yeah, because on an FHA loan, a PUD does not need to be approved, but on the VA loan, I do believe um, the PUD needs to be approved, just like the condo. Um, that's something we can, I can reach out to my scenario desk um, just to see any changes. And keep in mind, everything we, went over today, could change tomorrow. So guidelines are always changing. Um, I'm sure you've seen with COVID coming out, a lot of changes were made. Um, and a lot of things are starting to go back. But, you know, changes 
are always happening in the mortgage business. Things are evolving. Um, things are getting better. Sometimes things change um, for the worse, but um, er everything does does change here and there eventually. Okay. <clears throat> and then okay. on, Maria, you popped to the last slide. So I just, I figured this would just be too much going over, but other types of loans we do are a USDA loan. That's another 100% financing. A jumbo loan, if you recall a conventional loan, 510, a loan pops a dollar over that. So 510, 401, that's where we fall into the jumbo loan. Different credit, different down payment. And then the last one, a renovation mortgage, um, where a person purchases the home, but also takes out the mortgage to fix it up. So those are, that's something we could cover down the road. Or if you have any questions, you can always shoot me an email or give me a call. <coughs> but that is it. Any more questions for Paul? And then, uh, Paul, even construction loans don't really fall into this yet. Well, actually, uh, actually, good question. We do construction loans. Thank you. So, um, yeah, that's, that that's another thing we do. Construction loan kind of runs the same as a renovation mortgage, but it's something that's available. Is that also in the jumbo market? Three K. I'm sorry. Is that also called a two hundred three K? Yeah, so renovation mortgage is a 203K or a 203K streamline, and that's going to follow FHA guidelines. But we also have a conventional renovation loan. Okay. <clears throat> so again, it all depends on the buyer and which way we maybe put them if they're looking at a renovation mortgage. Okay. Paul, thank you. I love this. This is awesome. Maria, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Good questions, too. Yep. Makes us, makes us feel less like newbies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here anytime, nights, weekends. Give me a call anytime. Thanks again. Right, thank, thank you, Paul. You're thank you, Maria. You're welcome. Thank you. Have Take a nice care, day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.